it's hard for me to believe how young people process today. Um, sometimes I look at decisions that they make and I have to ask where the common, common sense is. I have to ask um, the convictions that they come up with. What, what convictions lead them to shape their worldview? Stories told about a young high school freshman whose name was Nathan Zollner who urged his classmates to sign a petition that demanded the strict elimination of the chemical dihydrogen monoxide. He gave them good reasons why they should sign on. He said, dihydrogen monoxide causes excessive sweating and vomiting. It's a major component in acid rain. It causes severe burns in this gaseous state. It'll kill you if you accidentally inhale it. It contributes to erosion. It decreases effectiveness in automobile brakes. It's been found in tumors of terminal cancer patients. 50 people were asked to sign on to this petition. 43 people did sign it, but what surprises me is six people were left undecided. Could you believe that? Six people refused to sign on to this petition. I mean, based upon the evidence that Nathan gave, what is there left to be undecided about? I mean, what does it take today to prove a cause, to get people to have a conviction behind that cause? Well, apparently very little. Because these freshmen had yet to roll in an introductory chemistry class. Dihydrogen monoxide. This is going to hurt you, but here we go. Di is two. Hydrogen is the element hydrogen. Mono is one. Oxide, the derivative of oxygen. We're basically talking about the molecule H2O. 43 people were easily persuaded based upon ignorance and false information to sign a petition that called for the strict elimination of water. (laughs) Deception has also happened in the church, hasn't it? Throughout the history of the Christian church. Whether the teachers are coming in intentionally or unwittingly, I don't really care. They're coming in. And they're bringing their attacks and they're spreading lies contrary to things that are taught in Scripture. As a matter of fact, when you read the New Testament, it's hard to find a single book in the New Testament that doesn't warn you about false teachers, about these wolves that come in disguised and dressed in the sheep's clothing. And all the right ingredients are there. You take a group of gullible people. You take people that want to hear what they want to hear. You take a culture of relativity. And you take an institution that basically says we're basing everything we do on faith. And again, everything is there in order for these people to lead the Christian church astray. Anything they bring seems to be accepted. Last week we learned in chapter 11, verse 2, that Paul was jealous for this Corinthian church for this very reason. He said that he, in verse 2, set them up in a marriage relationship to Jesus. There was an engagement, he said, a a Jewish betrothal, which was uh, just as close to a marriage as a marriage itself was back then. Remember, you couldn't leave a betrothal if you betrothed to someone in the Jewish culture other than death or divorce. He goes, I betrothed you to Christ. I set you up with Christ. He said in 1 Corinthians 4.15 that I'm like a father to this church. That it's my goal to present you to your husband on the wedding day as a pure virgin, verse 2. But instead of staying true to Jesus, instead of staying true to the the doctrine that he brought this church, the Corinthian church was committing spiritual adultery by following after the false gods that were introduced by the false teachers. In verse 3, he says, I compare to Eve. Just like Satan came in the garden in the form of a certain and deceived Eve, in the same way Satan has entered the church in the form of seductive teachers and deceived you. Why were they deceived? Verse 3. Because their minds were being led astray. Instead of basing truth upon Scripture, and again, you're in the first century, so the apostles are still giving Scripture back then, so we could say apostolic teaching, they believed anything that came down the pike to please their fleshly desires and carnal reasoning. Paul says in verse 3, their minds were led astray for the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's a review from last week. How were they led led astray? One, they outgrew a childlike love for Jesus. Two, they made the Holy Spirit into somebody he wasn't. 
And three, they went beyond the core boundaries of the gospel. They took the truth that the apostle gave them and they traded it for lies as easy it is to get up, flip the remote control switch, and change the channels on your television set. That's why Paul says in verse 4, For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you had not received, or a different gospel which you had not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Well, that's where we're going today. These three core elements, these three foundational principles that must be understood. You get these things wrong, folks. It's not a let's agree to disagree type discussion. It's the difference between heaven and hell. So let's do this. Let's compare the lies that were taught then, which are very similar to the lies that are being taught today, to what the Bible teaches. So this is our third point from last week's sermon uh, as we continue from that message. We call this the obstruction, point number three, and I'll have three subpoints, as you can see in your notes, regarding point number three. Paul now is going to reveal in verse 4 specifically where this church was going off base. He's going to talk about where the false teachers specifically were leading this church down a bad road. This is what brought him, as he says in verse 2, godly jealousy. And this is what verse 3 made him afraid. So let's take these each one at a time. Okay, here we go. First, they proclaimed, it says in verse 4, another Jesus. Look at verse 4 with me. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached. The problem with the false teachers was not that they didn't preach Jesus. They preached Jesus. They had no problem with Jesus. But it was, as Paul says, another Jesus. It was not the historical Jesus that is presented to us in the Gospels. They believed in Jesus, but it was another Jesus. For example, Muslims believe in Jesus. Any good Muslim will tell you that he or she loves Jesus. They will say that he is a prophet. As a matter of fact, they will say that he is one of the greatest prophets. A Muslim will believe in the virgin birth of Christ, the miraculous virgin birth of Christ. They'll believe that Jesus performed many miracles. But they will also say that he was never crucified, and he definitely is not God. But you talk to a Muslim, they will say, I believe in Jesus too. I even heard one Muslim say, we believe in Jesus more than the Christian does. How about a Mormon? Mormons believe in Jesus. They believe that he's the literal son of God. They believe in his life. They believe in his death. They believe in his resurrection. They believe that he is savior, that he is creator, that he is judge. They also believe that Jesus is created. They believe the Trinity is three gods. They believe Jesus atoned for sin on the cross and also atoned for sin at the Garden of Gethsemane. And the real strange one, they believe that Jesus was the product of relations between God, small g, God, and his goddess wife, who used to be people from another world. They believe that Jesus is the literal spirit brother of the devil and of you and me. Yet if you ask any good Mormon, they will say that they believe in Jesus. How about a Jehovah Witness? They'll come to your door. They'll tell you, we love Jesus. We believe in Jesus. And we're here to tell you about Jesus. That's why we came. We're here to tell you about Jesus. According to Jehovah Witness doctrine, they believe that Jesus is the reincarnation of the archangel Michael. Jesus is a created being. He is not God himself. And they believe that Jesus proved his devotion to God by submitting to a horrifying death, not on a cross, but a torture stake. They do not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, but every good Jehovah Witness will say that he or she believes in Jesus. But who's right? I just presented three different Jesuses. Who's the real Jesus? I can keep going, but I think you get the point. Just because someone tells you, folks, that they believe in Jesus does not mean they necessarily believe in the Jesus of Scripture, right? They believe in Jesus, but again, I keep coming back to this. Verse 4, Paul says, it's another Jesus, which in reality is what? No Jesus at all. Let me see if I can use some exaggeration, okay, to make my point here. Let's say you come up to me and say, um, 
I met, I met Billy Graham yesterday. I said, you met Billy Graham? Oh, yeah, I met Billy Graham. And I said, how's, how's, how's Billy Graham doing? He said, well, you know, he, he looks good for a 30-year-old. And, uh, you know, when I saw him at the bar, he was, he was drinking pretty heavily, but uh, he, he, just, he just came off his third divorce, and that probably explains the foul language he was using as well. But he hopes to get back on his feet pretty soon and resume his career as an astronaut. I said, you met Billy Graham? Uh-huh, I met Billy Graham. You can swear you met Billy Graham. You can even say Billy Graham is... The guy might have even been named Billy Graham. But I can tell you with all due respect, that's not the Billy Graham that we know as the world-famous evangelist. Right? You don't know Billy Graham. I'll keep going because I get people, not too many in this church, but I do get people that keep saying, um, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. They believe in Jesus. We're all brothers and sisters. Okay, this, so this one's, this one's for you. This one's for you. If you're in that category. Um, you're witnessing to me. And you start off with the, with the famous question. You see me on the street, and you want to share the gospel with me. You're doing your job. Good. You're an evangelist. And you say, I got a question for you. Mind if I ask you a question? I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And if you died tonight, where would you go? And I say, what are my options? And you say, heaven or hell? And I say, I'm going to heaven. And you say, you, 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 you're following up, you're doing a good job. Well, why would you go to heaven? Why would you go to heaven? Because I believe in Jesus and I love Jesus. And you say, here's what probably 98% of you would say. Amen! God bless you. You'd give me a big hug. Good to have you ever. Is a brother in Christ? Where do you go to church? Da, 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 da. Right? We go on to something else. But what if the other 2% of you said to me, can I ask you just one more question? Who is your Jesus? Tell me about your Jesus. And I say, my Jesus is this pulpit right here. I love this Jesus. <laughs> and I just hold my arms around this Jesus. It just gives me so much comfort and peace. And I talk to Jesus, and, and, and my Jesus, this pulpit, it talks back to me. And, and I believe the Bible that if you believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven, and, and this is my Jesus. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, with all due respect, that's not Jesus. And that Jesus is not going to get you to heaven. I remember hearing a story about John MacArthur who used to say that people could put on a bathrobe and go down to the beach and say they're Jesus and get a following all of a sudden. I mean, that was in... Southern California, that might explain part of it. <laughs> so the point is, you believe in Jesus. That's great that you believe in Jesus. Who's your Jesus? I mean, we have to come to the conclusion right now that there have to be some parameters that define who Jesus is. Y you can't just come up with a Jesus as a figment of your imagination. You can't go to Scripture and kind of piecemeal the Jesus that you want to believe in. Who's your Jesus? I think we also need to come to the agreement that Jesus is more than just a good teacher. He is, but he's more than that. He's more than a, a, a wise philosopher. He's more than a miracle worker. He's more than a man of compassion. He's more than a political guru. Who's Jesus? If I were to have you in, you guys are all doing a good job taking notes today. I know that, right? And you got your paper in front of you, you got your pen in front of you, you're writing things down. I said, number one to ten for me, and tell me on, in ten different lines who Jesus is. Give me ten characteristics of your Jesus. What would you put down? That'd be a good exercise to do. Who's your Jesus? Describe him to me. Here's what I'd say. I'd say, my Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary. I would say, my Jesus has no beginning and has no end. He is God himself. I would say, my Jesus is fully man and fully God. I'd say, my Jesus, at a certain point of historical time, took on human flesh to be our representative. I'd say, he lives and has lived without sin. I'd say, he died to make a complete atonement for sin. He was raised on the third day. He's the only mediator we need between God and man. I'd say he's seated at the right hand of the Father, prepared to judge the world. I'd say that he is both Savior and Lord. 
and I'd say, he's coming back again. That's the biblical Jesus. You see, you can't pick and choose. You've got to accept him for who he is. And, and who he is is not, again, what someone else says or a figment of your imagination. It is a determination based upon studying the Bible. If you don't have the biblical Jesus, you don't have Jesus. The Bible says, Paul told us in Acts 16, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It's not your faith that saves you. What saves you is your faith in the true Jesus. The chain is needed, but what matters is what's at the other end of the chain. What are you pulling in? Paul says that I may know him, Philippians 3.10. He's seeking to know the true Jesus. When he says, if anyone does not have the Lord or love the Lord, he is accursed, 1 Corinthians 16, 22. He's seeking to love the true Jesus. And what's so scary about this is that just like people don't know the true Jesus and they're clinging to a false Jesus, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7 that millions, that's my word in there, but it's probably even more than that, are going to come to the Lord on judgment day and basically say, here I am, and Jesus is going to say, I, I, I never even knew you. You didn't know me. You knew somebody else. You didn't know me, and I didn't know you. There was never a relationship. You believed in Jesus, but it wasn't me. False teachers presented Jesus. Just because someone says they love Jesus, they're telling about Jesus, does not mean they're a good teacher. What Jesus are they presenting to you? These guys, like many today, presented a counterfeit Jesus. It wasn't Jesus of the Bible. It was a Again, a figment of their imagination. And it doesn't matter if the church found hope in this Jesus. It was a false hope. And this Jesus was useless for salvation. All right, we've got to move on. In addition to hearing from the false teachers about a different Jesus, verse 4, they also heard about a different spirit. It's interesting that Paul does not deny that they received a spirit. Whatever the Spirit was, it was not the Holy Spirit that Paul presented to them. So what spirit did the false teachers bring if it wasn't the Holy Spirit? I have to believe it was some kind of a demonic spirit that twisted and maligned the work and the character of the true Holy Spirit. And we're warned about this in 1 Timothy 4.1. But the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, that's where we're living today, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. They brought a description of the Holy Spirit who was not the Holy Spirit, but this spirit that they brought to them had its roots in demonic influences. And what's neat is if you study the Corinthian epistles, 1 and 2 Corinthians, you start realizing exactly what kind of spirit they started following. It was not the Holy Spirit. It was this, this like, Wonder worker. They believed in a spirit that promised prosperity. The Holy Spirit wants you wealthy. He wants you healthy. The Holy Spirit wants you prosperous. They believed in a spirit that took pleasure in the showy. That the more bizarre and radical and demonstrative your display of faith is, the more you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when it just sits there and worships the Lord, the quietness of his heart must be a pretty immature, carnal believer. They took pleasure in a spirit that delivered you from all suffering. If you're suffering, there's something wrong. The spirit does not want you to suffer. So if you are suffering, if you are going through any kind of illness or trial right now, it's one of two things. Either you do not have enough faith in God to heal you, or you're in some kind of sin, and we've got to figure out what sin that is. They believe in the spirit that told you just let your minds go. That's worldly, the mind. It's so base, so fundamental, elementary, using your mind. Let it go. Just be mystical. The spirit, just everything's mystical. Let's spiritualize everything. Don't think. And they believe in the spirit that took the focus off of Jesus Christ and put the focus on himself. It's so 
ironic that so many people go to the Corinthian epistles to find an understanding of how the church should act when the Corinthian epistles were written as a rebuke to those who think the Spirit should act in a certain way. It's a false work. It's a rebuke to people who believed in the false work of the Spirit. The epistles are telling us through the Apostle Paul, the Spirit does not act and how these churches were in error in this regard. So again, who is the Holy Spirit then and what does he do? Again, you got your paper in front of you. You don't have to do this. You can do it if you want. In number one to ten, who's the Spirit? I mean, if we can't do that, we're going to easily be pray for all the false teachers that come down the pike. Who is the Holy Spirit? What does he do? You got to know truth to discern error. I'd say he's the third person of the Holy Trinity. He is not a force, but he is God himself. He's the author of Holy Scripture. He came in his full presence at Pentecost, and he dwells within the lives of all believers. We receive him, we receive his fullness at the very split second of salvation. What does he do? He regenerates hearts. It means he, he enables people to believe in Jesus. He takes dead, holy, stony, uh, stony hearts and makes them into a heart of flesh. He gives people the, 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 the ability to trust Jesus. He baptizes believers equally in the body of Christ. He convicts people of sin and he grants repentance. He helps us to pray and he helps us to understand Scripture, the Scripture he inspired. He leads us, he comforts us, he sanctifies us. That means he makes us more holy. He is the Holy Spirit after all. He empowers us for service. He seals us. He provides the assurance of our faith. He distributes spiritual gifts to all believers. He brings unity and oneness to the body of Christ and he brings glory not to himself, but always to Jesus Christ. Comes back again. I'm going to be a broken record in this, folks, this sermon. Examining everything with the word of God. 1 John 4, 6. The apostle John says, We are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. The Apostle John is in the apostolic area. It's the time when Scripture is still being written. So when the Apostle John spoke, he's speaking Scripture. If you know God, he says, you listen to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know, here it is, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How? Apostolic teaching. Your Bible. Different Jesus, a different spirit, last one. Logical consequence of the first two. If you've got a different Jesus and a different spirit, you're going to have a different what? Gospel, right? This is not the gospel that Paul brought and not the gospel, as he says, that you guys accepted when I was there. Verse 4, he calls it a different gospel, which you had have not accepted. Like Jesus and like the Spirit, we can't simply take any gospel message and believe that that message then is our ticket to salvation because there is only one gospel that saves. It's the gospel message contained in the Bible. You can't tamper with this thing. You can't change it just a little bit. And these false teachers weren't just in Corinth. They were in Galatia as well. And Paul tells the Galatian church, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. It's okay. You got your gospel. I got my gospel. Paul says, no, it's not another gospel. But there's some who are disturbing you. I want to distort the gospel of Christ. He goes on to warn. But even if we, apostolic community, or an angel from heaven, should present to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As I've said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Let me give you the key ways that I can determine that these heretical teachers were twisting and maligning the true gospel, turning it into a false gospel. Okay? Here we go. I'm just going to give you about five or so. Number one, instead of preaching the historical Jesus, as we learn, found on the pages of Scripture, primarily the Gospels, they invented a Jesus that was more acceptable and palatable to what unbelievers in the world would want to hear. And if you're following me, I 
my last blog that I wrote, I wrote in response to prepare you for this sermon. Because that's the movement nowadays. We just got to get people saved, so let's just chain things around. Let's just make it more palatable. Let's make it more accepting to people in this world. Number two, instead of prioritizing the work of Jesus where he accomplished his work of redemption, they either ignore the cross altogether. That's what they did. The false teachers back then would have said, Jesus died on the cross. That's good. He died for sins. That's good. But let's move beyond that now. Let's move on to some more advanced Christianity. We're done with the cross. That got you in the door. That's fine. Good. Okay, we're all saved. Let's, let's leave that behind now. Or they say there's a place for the cross. But the place for the cross now is since, again, if Jesus didn't die for my sins, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that God's a holy God and he judges people and he judged Jesus and Jesus had to spill his blood. That's gory. Yuck. For my behalf. Um, so, well, but he died on a cross. So how do I, oh, man. Um, oh, I know. Jesus died on the cross to prove how much he loves me. There you go. Which is true, but it's much more than that, isn't it? He just wanted to show me how much he loves me. I like that. Or I got this. Jesus wanted to show his devotion to the Father. Or um, how about um, Jesus told us how we should lay our lives down for a good cause. That's the purpose of the cross. It's not the gospel. Number three, instead of believing that a person is saved, be very slow on this, by grace alone, And by faith alone, people teach that human achievement is also necessary to obtain salvation. Yes, Jesus is good. Yes, grace is good. But there's also, you you, got to do good stuff. You got to have good deeds. Number four, which is just like it, instead of teaching that Jesus is sufficient, we add man-made legalistic requirements of the gospel that are necessary for salvation. Yes, you need Jesus, but you need to do A, B, C, and D as well. And number five, instead of promoting righteous living, which will always follow on the heels of people who have received this gospel, it will always result in righteous living if you receive Jesus Christ, we teach that once you're saved, obedience to Jesus and his lordship is optional. came to Jesus, God, you're saved. You got your fire insurance. You're in, you're in, okay? You, you prayed a prayer? Good, okay, I don't care what you prayed. I don't care what Jesus you believed in. I don't care what gospel you heard. You, you prayed a prayer? Good, you're in, you're in. You got your fire insurance. Now, when, when you get around to it, um, we're gonna go to step two, and that's, that's the, the discipleship phase. But, you know, you do that when you feel good and ready to do that. I, I look at all five of these folks, and I say, has much changed in the last 2,000 years? It's the same. So, you got your paper out, you got your pencil out, what's the true gospel? I'll make it easy on you. I'll just have you number from one to four this time, okay? (laughs) What's the true gospel? Number one, it teaches us that God is perfectly holy. It's got to start with God, not with me. God is perfectly holy, he is separate from sin, he hates sin, he must punish sin, and he will never allow an ounce of sin into his eternal presence. That's number one. Number two, that all humans, all humans are guilty of sin. Guilty of sin from the very time of their birth. That even believers that are human still have a a, a propensity towards sin as they are led into sin based upon the flesh. That all human beings, in a sense, love sin. That we can go a day without sinning. That we're guilty of sin that we're not even aware of was sin in the first place. We did it anyway. And we're guilty of sin that we knew was wrong and we still did it. We're all guilty of sin. All the amount of good deeds in the world are not going to get rid of my sin. Because of that, and God is holy and I'm a sinner, there's no hope of ever saving myself apart from God's divine intervention. But praise God that he has intervened. Praise God that he is a God of love and a God of mercy and a God of compassion. And he said, there's nothing they can do, but I'll do something for them. I'll send Jesus to the cross. 
I'll send one that'll come in a, a human form, take on flesh, be a human substitute, a representative for all humanity, and he will go to the cross, and he will die for the sins of my people. I will place the sins of my people on him. He will die. He will receive justice. Sin is taken away. Justice is accomplished. And they will get the perfect righteousness of Christ when they, step number four, receive Christ. And they believe on the basis of faith. They trust the one who paid the full penalty for their sin in sin's entirety, past, present, and future. And they repent. They commit to turn from sin and follow Jesus as Lord. That's what it means to receive Jesus. Those are the four steps. Boil it down for you. The holiness of God, sinfulness of man, the person and work of Christ, faith and repentance. Is that still too much to remember? God, man, Christ, response. That's the true gospel. So with all the lies that are being taught today, let's see what happens when this foundation is shaken. The attacks first, the, 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 the warheads are first aimed at the holiness of God. I got to get rid of, nothing's going to work until I get rid of the holiness. I'm just going to pull that one card out. I got news for you, God's not holy. God is going to be blasphemed in every movie that we produce in America. God is going to be the punchline of jokes. God is just a man upstairs, and he didn't make you. You just evolved. We're going to allow people to take his name in vain everywhere they go. The oh my G-O-Ds. It's not holy. He's an impotent, grandfatherly type figure that winks at sin and lets everybody go to heaven. That's the God. That's the God that most of America has accepted. Now I could drive a Mack truck through my hermeneutic. Because if God is not holy, step two, I'm not sinful. I'm not sinful. And even if I am sinful, okay, I'm not perfect. That's not going to punish me. That's not going to hold me accountable. I mean, most people go to heaven, and I'm a good person. And, you know, there's no such place as hell. That's, they put that in the Bible just to scare you. You see where this goes? So when my daughters in the public school, both of them have done this now, are in American literature class, and they're reading Jonathan Edwards' Puritan classic from one of the greatest minds that America's ever produced, by the way, his sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and they're reading it, and all the kids in the class are scoffing at this thing. And the rest of the class is making fun of it. Because they're concluding, what kind of God is that? That's not my God. My God's not an angry God. My God doesn't punish sin. My God lets all people go to heaven. And I'm a good person. I deserve probably to be in the front of the line. What a joke this thing is. You see what happens? And if we throw away guilt before God and we throw away accountability before a holy God, then what do we have a need for Jesus for anymore? You see, he just slips out of the picture. He just naturally falls away. You get rid of the wrath of God upon sin and Jesus Christ becomes a big yawn. What do you need a Savior for? I'm already going to heaven. It makes your religion better than my religion. God loves me. I'm a good person. You get rid of Jesus, and well, you get rid of step four, faith in Jesus, obviously. I mean, the primary thing that is needed, according to the Bible, regarding salvation is faith in Jesus. If I get rid of Jesus, I don't, I don't need the faith anymore. And if there is faith in Jesus, the faith in Jesus that's expected of me is faith in Jesus no different than my faith in George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. Sure, I believe in Jesus. Most people on the streets in this region of New Jersey will say they believe in Jesus. Of course I believe in Jesus. But in their estimation of who Jesus is, he's Abraham Lincoln. He was a good man who lived a long time ago. And if that's what it means to get me to heaven, I believe. No loyalty, no devotion. I'm not going to bed at night worshiping George Washington. I'm not reading what George Washington wrote and trying to align my life with what he said. 
I'm not singing hymns of praise to George Washington. I have no allegiance to George Washington. Or even worse, faith becomes whatever you want to place your faith in. There's one God, but there's many ways to get to that God, many ways up the mountain. Spirituality is good. We don't deny that. You got Jesus? Don't, don't knock the God that's got Allah then, okay? Don't knock Buddha, man. You know, you guys, these are all good world religions. And if some guy wants to get to Jesus based upon astrology or based upon meditation or based upon worshiping nature or pleasure or fill in the blank, his way is as good as your way. All you need is faith and a higher power. That's all that matters. And Paul's saying, when I was with you guys, that's not the Jesus nor the Holy Spirit nor the gospel that I presented to you. I leave, and the minute I leave, these false teachers come in, and they contradict truth with error. And as he says at the end of verse 4, I love this, and you bear this beautifully. Or NIV, what does NIV say? You put up with this easy enough. I was just shaking up. This was the 18 months. Lies come in. You guys should have been rejecting those lies, and you're tolerating them. You know, you, I'm sure you're aware of this, that there's just a, uh, a rush of books lately on, um, it's usually little boys too, little boys who supposedly die and go to heaven, right? There's a bunch of them out there. They're bestsellers. There's a bunch of them out there. Little boys die, supposedly die, go to heaven. Um, they describe what heaven's like, and they come back, and they, 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 they tell everybody. And then they write books, and they make movies and all that kind of stuff. And I know Christians that are, that are like not only reading these books, but drooling over these books. They're going to these books for their information as to what heaven is going to be like someday. I got an email on uh, Friday, just two days ago, uh, which gave a link to a, an article uh, which was very enlightening. And it was in reference to the book, um, not Heaven is for Real, that's not that book, but the other one, which is The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. And that young man recently made this confession. He said, I did not die, I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. But what's neat is he goes on to say this. When I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to do so. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible. Those who market these materials must be called to repent and hold the Bible as enough we got to kind of get on the same page on this, and I think we are, but I think we just need to keep reaffirming this, that when it comes to doing business at this church, that the only thing we're going to hold as reliable is Scripture, okay? Is that fair enough? It's not how you feel. It's not your experiences. It's not the dream you had last night. It's not what you had for breakfast that made you think a certain way, okay? What matters, and all that matters, is the Bible, And if we have any teacher in this church, from the pulpit all the way down to teaching uh, six-month kids in the nursery that teach anything other than the Word of God, they need to be removed. And that all of us as a church would never accept anything that adds to or contradicts biblical truth. All right? Let's pray. I want to call up uh, prayer partners right now. We have two people coming up that um, uh, will be up here. If you want to come up and talk to someone, they'll be here from now until uh, after the service concludes. Um, You can come up even now if you want to. If you're sitting here today and you're wondering, boy, um, I don't understand what he said, but I think I need to figure this out before I leave. Uh, These people are here to speak to you. Please, um, come up now. Come up when I get done praying. Uh, If there's anyone here today that says, I came in thinking I was saved, but the Jesus I believe is not that Jesus presented, or I believe the gospel, but it's not the biblical gospel. I need to pray with someone. I need to get this, get this straight. Um, please, don't leave today. I just want to encourage you, men and women, that I believe you are here uh, by God's sovereign decision. All of you did a lot to, to get up today and to get yourself ready to maybe first time here, find directions to the church. Uh, that's not a coincidence. There's a purpose that you're here. There's a reason that you heard this message today. I don't want anyone leaving. It's because I love you. I care about you. Without knowing what it means 
to be saved from hell and to have eternal life and hope and peace with Christ. So if you need to talk to someone about this, you need to pray with someone, you just need to confess some sin, need some clarification, please. Uh, excellent man and woman up here uh, that would be more than helpful, thankful to, to speak with you and help point you in the right direction. And Father, we pray for our church too, that we as a church will forever love Jesus, that we will keep a simple and pure faith, not a childish faith, but a childlike faith, that as we grow in our knowledge of who Christ is, the biblical Jesus, that it would never go beyond the historical Jesus that's presented to us in Scripture, and that our doctrine would never give us a greater love and fascination than just a pure love for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the true gospel. Thank you for lives that are changed as a result of it. Thank you for the obedience that comes forth as Christ leads us through the power of the Holy Spirit to conform to his character. And thank you for a church of people that believe this and have accepted this by your grace and are living this out and the great unity and fellowship we can enjoy because we're all people going in the same direction. May we as a church uphold the Bible. Lord, I know that there are some issues that there's some agreement to disagree, but not on these core issues. These core issues clearly unite all Christians around this world. The biblical truth of the person of Christ, the person of the Spirit, and the true gospel message. May your Bible be taught in churches all over this world. And may we do it in this church, clearly teaching the Word of God without error, without compromise, without any inconsistencies, that Christ may be exalted as Lord and people might hear the true message that you can use by the power of the Holy Spirit to save souls and bring them into eternal life. Thank you for the scriptures that make things so clear to us. Thank you for revelation. Thank you for leaving us with a witness. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen.